I started transitioning without actually knowing what I was doing. I was 15, I had just started sixth form. How come Malta is so advanced on LGBTIQ rights and perhaps not so much on women's rights? And we all ha we're all objectified and all sexualized. We can't just be ourselves, we have to be a sexual object. The amount of transgender women I know who are having affairs with married men, with cisgender married men, with kids, with, you know, high profile people, um, simply because it's just Again, the way it's explained to me is the excitement of being with a transgender woman. Wow, okay, so, I mean, this is a massive, massive package to unpack. There are billions of women passing through similar experiences all around the world, and for whatever reason, we often feel like we're alone. It's time to make a point of discussing these topics from a range of viewpoints. Women in the workplace, fertility, the menopause, women's rights, social media, sexuality, body image, politics, relationships, parenting, age, and women in their role today. These conversations surpass age, race, location. They are relevant to women everywhere. Welcome to The She Word. Conversations that women rarely have, but really should. There is one idea that makes life just an okay life. It is that everything moves in one straight line. But we have a different idea about life, where you can start over every day. A circular journey. At Browns, we curate for that journey. For you to find your better self, your more confident self, healthier self, comfortable self. Start your journey today. Find your way to wellness with Browns. Welcome to The She Word, conversations that women rarely have but really should. And today's conversation is about women, sexuality and gender. And I am really excited to have three amazing guests with me today. First up, of course, I have Gabby Kalea, an activist in LGBTQ rights, but also relentlessly pursuing equality and acceptance for the lesbian and gay community and beyond. I've got Carly Naudi, Maltese transgender model, who has openly shared your story and your journey to be where you are today. And also Maya Coxon, a member of the fetish community in Malta, uh, who describes herself as pansexual and polyamorous. And these are terms that we're going to unpack. And I will say you ladies, you may use terms during the course of this podcast, and I might stop you and ask because I'm a little bit green on this topic and I'm really looking forward to being educated and informed. But I'm gonna start with you, Gabby. We're going to ask each one of you just to give me a little bit of background of how you got to where you are today. What's your journey? <laughs> well, a lifetime in two minutes, right? <laughs> so. Well, you could maybe a few more, Gabby, maybe a few more than two minutes. But yeah, but I'm, I'm sure your, your journey is exciting to be where you are today. Where, how did you get here? Well, uh, I'm what is known in, in uh, the community as a late developer, which means I came out quite late in life, uh, in, in my early 30s. Uh, that's when I figured myself out. Uh, and uh, I happened to be living in the UK at the time, working in Bristol. And uh, when I came back, I found, I tried to find ways to, to meet other people. Um, and since I was into volunteering, I thought, well, this might be something that could help me uh, uh, to to meet other people, so I contacted MGRM, uh, which stands for the Malta LGBTIQ Rights Movement. Okay, I uh, had an initial meeting with them. At the time, volunteers were kind of vetted because you know uh, there were safety concerns as well. And uh, how long ago are we talking about here? We're talking twenty years ago. Now. Oh wow! Oh wow! So, okay, all right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so from then on, I, I got in involved in the LGBTIQ movement and after a few years, I became the coordinator and fully fledged activist. <laughs> well, see, now you've done that in two minutes, but that's a whole show right there. So we might, we might have to go a little bit deeper into that. And I, and I suddenly I do have a bunch of questions and I'm going to come back to you in just a second. Carly, your journey, how 
Oh, wow. <laughs> you can have <laughs> a few try, more than two And minutes. try and, and follow Gabby's lead. Um, so my sort of activism started in 2018. I was asked to walk um, during Malta Fashion Week. I did. Um, and the journalist sort of approached me and said, you know, kind of it would be a really interesting and inspirational story to kind of mention you being the first trans- open transgender model um, to walk during Malta Fashion Week. Um, I had three shows, so one designer asked me and then another two kind of approached me Um, and kind of I thought about it, basically it was a bit of, I needed to think a bit about it because I grew up with the mentality of, of, you know, being transgender is taboo or or you're made to feel as though you're lesser than than any other being sort of thing and um, ultimately I thought to myself, you know what, like I don't care sort of thing, people can say whatever, people can do whatever, like I'm happy, I'm doing what makes me happy and I'm not hurting anyone in the process. So I agreed to, you know, do the interview and I'm really lucky that it had such a positive response. Um, and then through there, I kind of, you know, started with the activism. I mean, obviously, I'm not as um, involved as Gabby is, um, but, you know, I try to do the best I can. <laughs> but your transgender journey as well? My transgender journey? Mm, we're going to need more than a few minutes for that. That's fine. That's um, to be honest, I started transitioning without actually knowing what I was doing. I was 15. I had just started sixth form. And obviously, I was make, it was easier for me to make friends with girls uh, rather than boys. And we sort of st- they started with, oh, you know, let's like pluck your eyebrows and, you know, let's try some mascara. And I always had super long fingernails. Um, and so we started with the nail polish. So I literally just started transitioning without actually knowing what I was doing sort of thing. Um, and then eventually we started with women's jeans and, you know, tighter tops and kind of... What what actually happened and then was I met a friend uh, who's now a very good friend, but at the time we ju- were just acquaintances. He was older and sort of explained to me, you know, the difference between um, being transgender, being um, gay, being lesbian sort of thing. I mean, I had the basic idea, but I was very green, as you put it, uh, myself. So kind of, I just found myself in it. It wasn't something that was pre-planned or that, you know, it just sort of happened gradually. Wow, and then here you are today, a beautiful model. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, Maya, tell us a little bit about your backstory as well. Well, probably a completely different um, perspective coming from the UK rather than Malta. Um, Came over into Malta about 10 years ago, but uh, growing up in the UK, um, I had a very, I think I'm quite privileged to have a very open uh, household where my mum was openly gay. So it was just never an issue to be like I remember coming out and it was so anticlimactic. She's like, oh, okay, thanks, love. And I just <laughs> went back on the computer and I'm like, oh, was such a big thing for me and so underblown. Um, and so for me, like uh, exploring things like with myself, with polyamory and that understanding, it was always, I, I always just had that understanding that love for me was always about many people, not many people, but with not constrained to one person, shall we say. And that's um, what poly- polyamory means. Yes, exactly. It's, it's having le- loving, nurturing, connected um, relationships with other people, just like in a monogamous relationship, but with more than one person. Um, it's just as important and just as, as valued as, as in monogamy. Um, and so that's something I explored as a teenager. Um, and things like, I, I guess as, as we're, if you said differently with yourself, Gabby, um, Carrying on that discovery later in life, I had it very early as a teenager. I was experimenting with, with different uh, people, genders. It was never an issue of, oh, I'm, I'm a woman, I have to be with a man or a cisgendered man. It had to be, I was just exploring relationships with people. And that's why I did these things with like more of the fetish element before we really knew what the terms were. It was before the internet, you know, we were, older than I look, maybe, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and so a lot of these terms I just didn't know or what they were. It was just about exploration. And that was, that was a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, you just mentioned terms there. And recently it's become uh, much more spoken about to use terms like transgender, body dysmorphia, pansexual, polyamorous, LB- LGBTQI+, and everything that goes with that. And it would appear that new descriptions relating to sexuality and gender really have exploded in recent years. And this just jumps straight into what is important and why we're having this conversation. Because what do these terms, firstly, what do these terms mean? And secondly, why are we seeing this now? You said yourself you're a late developer, but suddenly 
we're having these conversations that may be 20 or 30 years ago and using terms that 20 or 30 years ago, as you said, you kind of knew that you were, you were into fetish before even fetish had a label. Why are we doing this now? Well, I think, first of all, it's a good thing, right? So, yes. <laughs> that, that young people today have the space to actually explore all of these uh, issues and, and their own identities, uh, probably at a much younger age uh, than uh, would otherwise have been the case. Um, uh, so it's, it's, I think, been a journey of, of societal transformation in a sense, right? As, as people became more aware of the existence of LGBTIQ people um, and, and that also opened up discussions around sexuality and gender identity in and of themselves. So um, one of the, the questions I, I, I often get is by... by people from other countries is how come Malta is so advanced on LGBTIQ rights and perhaps not so much on women's rights, for example. Um, so uh, in, in, in our context, LGBTIQ rights, in, in a sense, are spearheading and supporting the advancement also of, of women's rights, uh, which is uh, extraordinary in and of itself. Uh, but I, I think it's good that young people today, also because of the internet, right? Because there okay. are so many sources of information today. You are not limited to the community of people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a whole world out there that you can reach out to. So that's also transformed. I remember my first forays into messenger chat rooms, which were, you know, by today's standards, uh, quite archaic um, and, and how difficult it was just to try and, and link up with people who might be going through the, your, your own journey, right? Some, some things that, that you might have in common, where, whereas today it's just so easy, you know, you just put your profile out there and then you put in a search word and immediately, right, this community, global community is, um, is, is at your fingertips. So I think that's another part of the... Of, of the journey. Um, uh, and of course, also to a certain extent, right? The, the, um, the loss that the, the church's stranglehold had on society uh, now allows for people to, to judge what is good and bad, right? What, what, what is sinful or not and, 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 and uh, what is um, of value within their own lives uh, in, in a different way, right? It's, it's not one vision of uh, what, what people should be and how people should act. So in that case, was your journey, physical, literal physical journey to the UK, party to your journey of discovering yourself because you mentioned there about the church and of course in the UK situations are very different so was that part of your your story not intentionally but yes uh, <laughs> ironically I was actually working as a diocesan youth uh, worker with uh, a catholic diocese in in Clifton based in Bristol so I was actually employed by the church <laughs> oh wow in, okay in the UK uh, but I think being away from Malta and and from my my family and from you know, uh, everything that perhaps here would have constrained me allowed, in a sense, my subconscious, right? The, the opportunity to, to explore and, and to come to terms with this part of my identity. So, uh, yes, unwittingly, it, it did. Uh, <laughs> I still remember the first time I, I decided to call this, this helpline in, in the uh, UK. I tried several times and just put down the phone because I, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but, uh, you know, um, and, and uh, that was quite terrifying. And then the first time I sort of walked by uh, a gay bar up and down for a number of times before I eventually went in and discovered it looked like just any other bar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was... So I'm and then you have serve yeah. drinks as well. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. But, but you just hi you highlighted something that, and I'm going to ask you guys as well, because you, we, as society, have these this term that I've just become familiar with, which is vanilla. And I would say that most of society perceives itself as vanilla, as being... I'm getting a big no-no <laughs> from Not Carly in, over there. I don't know. I, I'm just... Referring to my cis uh, straight friend, and I wouldn't say so. I, I, in all fairness, I think I'm the vanilla one out of my my group of girls. 
one of my group of girls, because I have more than one group of girls. Well, we're going to come to that. I mean, good grief, <laughs> this show is exploding in the first 10 minutes. But you mentioned there about a fear. You put the phone down, you walk past the gay bar, and you... Why? F because I want to come and ask you about this fear as well. Why for you that fear? Well, we're talking 20 years ago, uh, so it, it was really a different world. I, I didn't know anyone uh, in my uh, circle who was out and open as an LGBTIQ person. I didn't even know there were gay bars in Malta um, or people or, or places where, where, you know, gay people uh, frequented. Um, it, it was just an invisible community to me, at least. Um, uh, I'm sure it wasn't like that for everyone in the community. There were places where people went and parties that people gathered at and, and, and so on. But I, I just wasn't aware of them. I was very much involved in youth ministry within the church uh, as a young person uh, where, you know, uh, LGBTIQ issues were simply not talked about. And if they were, it was never <laughs> in a positive manner. So, you know, um, uh, the, the whole value system that I, my, my whole baggage uh, didn't help in that sense. Um, I mean, you know, my wife said, I can't believe you didn't know you were gay until you were 30. It's not possible, you know, because once I realized that I could see all the signs, right? So I'm, I'm a very stereotypical lesbian in that sense. So... It, even looking back, you know, myself, I say, how did I not figure this out sooner? But I didn't. So that's that's the way it worked out for me. There's there's no right time or wrong time. It happens when it happens, I suppose. Maya, you are actually the person that taught me this phrase, vanilla. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Over quite a few glasses of wine. <laughs> it has been a few learning curves with, with my friend Maya here recently. But, but you also have being part of a sexual community or a, a part of a community outside of what would normally be considered to be the norm, let's say. Did you ever go through a fear like like Gabby has? Have you ever feel, felt fearful? or? Um, um, I felt even speaking today is more fearful, fearful to speak about the, my sexual proclivities within the kink community rather than my... Um, Whoa, sexual. back up there, girl. The kink <laughs> community is what? <laughs> so... Um, well, kink is really anything that deviates from the norm. It's really any 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 act that produces sexual arousal that's not really there for procreation. So it could be anything, really. It could be, this is where we get close to, like, um, lines with gay as well, because really queer sex is, is not there for procreation a lot, most of the time. So, and, and we've seen a lot of problems over the, over the years where um, things like um, the gay community and the, and the fetish community have had a lot of overlap with that kind of stigma um because if you're not producing baby babies then what's the point and it's all about really about and this is why when it's so important for female sexuality it's about subjugating women um we have a lot of problems at, at uh probably i'm probably diverging from the, the question i do apologize <laughs> um there's a lot of problems with the um the kink community in the same way that the gay community in that it was seen as a form of, of trauma um, and that it was a result of trauma and that made you gay or that makes you kinky. It, it doesn't at all. <laughs> and obviously it's been um, disproven. Um, but even even th these days, you've got the um, like the DSM-5. Um, it was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was it 2013 that um, kink was taken out of the DSM as a mental illness? Okay, DSM being? The... Um, the Diagnostic Statistic uh, uh, Manual. So it, it's it's the list of mental health disorders uh, that is uh, produced in the US. Yeah. And asexuality is still in there. So it's, it's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, this is a massive, massive package to unpack. And I'm pretty sure we can't do all of it today. I'm f fairly sure we can't do all of it today. Now, I just mentioned to you, uh, Carly, about vanilla and you were like, whoa, hang on a second, I'm vanilla. But do, have you ever, in your journey, ever experienced fear, like Gabby mentioned back there? Um, I think to a certain extent, everyone within the community will, will at some point, you know, experience fear. Um, I think, and I love how, we, you know, we've all had a different sort of journey. Um, I think for me, it's the way I explain it to my friends is I'm part of gay world. But I'm also part of the cis world. So, yes, I will go to the gay parties and I will, you know, have fun with my gay friends and, you know, look fabulous and all this stuff. But and then kind of there will also be times where I just want to go to a cisgender, you know, straight, mostly straight party and just, you know, 
meet a guy, dance, you know, just not be the center of attention and be all fabulous all the time. Like I'm sometimes. sorry, you don't want to be the center of attention and fabulous all the time? I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's you're, when you're at, or at least for me, the way I explain it is you're part of both of the worlds. And so I feel that even though, you know, we're, we've really progressed in relation to education for LGB, I think the T still lacks. I mean, even younger people and even people within the LGBTQ community um, still don't know the difference between sexuality and gender. So, you know, your gender is what you identify as. You identify as female, I identify as female. Gabby identifies as female sort of thing. Um, so you would be a cisgender woman because you were, um, you would identify with the sex that you were born with. In my case, it would be transgender because I did not identify as the gender I was um, born with. However, it has nothing to do with my sexuality. So just because you are a cisgender female, it does not, you know, there's nothing stating that you have to like men. So your sexuality would be who you are attracted to. If you are attracted to women, that would make you homosexual. If you are, you know, attracted to men in your case, and in my case, we are both um, heterosexual. So, you see, there, there's just these little things that even even people within the community still don't understand. And I think that's really a good point because you, in that respect, educated me in a message just the other day. Can we make this show about gender and sexuality, not just about sexuality? Because what you've just said there is bang on, is that the two are not the same. Mm -hmm. And I think quite often there is, whilst we're talking about all these different labels, we're talking about fetish, polyamorous, um, you know, all these all these labels that have been coming up, LGBTQI+. They get put into one box and said every you know everything is outside of vanilla and vanilla is the norm and of course that's not the case and the statistic is that in a 2021 study researchers found that between 2011 and 2019 college age women had increasingly moved away from exclusively heterosexual to 2019 65% of women reported only being attracted. In 2019, 65% of women reported only being attracted to men, a notable decrease from 77% in 2011. So it appears that as these labels, and as you said, that exploration on the internet in actual fact, as that is happening, sexuality and gender are opening up. But quite often that understanding of what you're referring to is missing and i think it comes to the problem with the internet now is that it's grown so much that you don't know what information is right and what information isn't and um, so that's why i constantly advocate for education in schools especially for children to understand the difference between gender and sexuality i've got three nephews and a niece and last friday i actually told the youngest to about myself and I explained it to them and you know I give them the opportunity for questions and that way now at school if anyone tells them you know because one of the parents would have seen me on the cover of a magazine or something sort of thing um my, my nephews and my niece are equipped to say so yes that's my aunt what's what, what's the problem I'm not understanding sort of thing so you know, just by normalizing it in inverted commas <laughs> um you, you're literally normalizing it because you know there's there's Nothing wrong in it. Do we have enough education? We're improving. Um, uh, it, I think there's quite a lot of work that's gone on uh, to sort of uh, mainstream LGBTIQ issues and sexuality and relationships more broadly uh, within our educational system. Um, uh, 
it's not a subject that students are tested on, so we don't really know what they end up with in the end. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we are moving in the right direction in, in, in terms of the actual syllabus uh, and the efforts that are, that are being put in in, in how this, uh, these subjects are tackled uh, within education. You have the occasional you know, parent who, who objects and who creates a, a bit of a storm in a teacup, but they're largely the minority. So the, the majority of, of uh, uh, multi-society agrees with an, an inclusive educational system. So this helps. Um, For you, Maya, I mean, you talked about the fact that you were probably more aware of a fetish or kink leaning as a, at a very early age. I don't think that's included. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Well, my question <laughs> was going to be... <laughs> it's awkward. You've just jumped the gun there because my question was going to be, how did you know? If, they, if that wasn't part of your education, how did you know? And what, what point do, does that... Should that be included? Because as, as the statistics show, we're moving away with moving away as a society from what would be considered vanilla. Yeah, and I think... I'm going to keep saying vanilla because I love this term, but anyway. <laughs> a little bit of spice on that. Um... No, I think it's really important that we do more with the education because with the education, um, because essentially we were talking earlier about the education kids get through um, internet these days, and it's vastly misinformed, and they're seeing quite horrific things as just the norm, and they're not really reflective of of sexuality and loving, nurturing relationships. Um, things like because these days uh, they were saying um, like there's a, a massive leap of uh, girls suffering. Um, Throat, throat uh, damage because of choking is very acceptable in, in porn these days. And so they're going ahead not knowing, one, there's a special way you do it, um, and two, that you don't go to beyond your partner's thresholds. It's all about consent and ba clear um, stated boundaries and, and safety. Choking is actually a really, as in the fetish world, choking is actually quite a, a serious thing to do because it's quite detrimental to your health if you do it wrong. And yet kids are just watching the internet, seeing these things and trying it out. Well, we should have more kind of just more sober conversations with these teenagers or, you know, young adults to say, look, you're going to see this on inter the internet. It's part of many, many activities that as adults you'll be doing, probably, if that's what, the way you're leaning. But let's be sober and, and analytical about what it's, you're going to be doing so you don't hurt somebody while you're doing it. Seriously, it's meant to be this consensual act between adults. I think we're both a little vanilla through. <laughs> we keep looking at each other. Like. Because all through that conversation, talking about the choking, Carly kept, catch, kept, kept catching my eye and we're going, oh my word, oh my the, word, oh my, my word. No, don't, don't touch my neck. No. But that's no. the thing, like you don't feel comfortable with it and yet girls are feeling corralled into doing it because it's the done thing. You know, the internet says it, so that's what my boyfriend wants me to do to me and it's like... No, you have you have autonomy over your body, over your sexuality. Oh, it's so important that you you know what you love and what you enjoy, and and that's a beautiful thing with a partnership or more than um, to have that kind of free exchange of desires. And I think that's really attractive. I don't. A lot of people feel cor corralled into having to do things because it's the done thing. And but when you talk about this, you're talking about this fetish. You're talking about kink and and so on. I mean, each each of you are within sub-communities. Is, seriously, in Malta, do we have these? Because if that would be your point of reference, that would be where you would go. There was a sharp intake of breath from Carly there. Do we have these communities? Do you have a transgender community? Oh, my God. Um, okay, the, I'm going to take that as possibly a the, no. The thing is, and I'm sure Gabby understands, and probably so do you, with um, being a transgender woman, for the most part, I don't know if it's Malta, I don't know if it's movies I don't know it's fetishized and this is something that just angers me because I'm not a fetish sort of thing um but there's something about I can't I can't even understand it and I can't even explain it so please feel free to kind of jump in but the amount of transgender women I know who are having affairs with married men with cisgender married men with kids with you know high profile people um simply because it's just again the way it's explained to me is the excitement of being with a transgender woman pre-op especially I feel I should mention pre-op just baffles me so the pre-op being so pre-op would be before having gender reassignment surgery post-op would be after having uh, gender reassignment surgery 
basically. So why pre-op then? I would love to know. So Gabby, if you can shed some light, please. And you see the whole me. table looks at Gabby but now. It's something, <laughs> it's something that angers me to a point because again, I don't know if it's just trickle down mentality where it's like I'm just a sex object or I'm just here for your sexual gratification. So it's just... But you know, before we get to Gabby and her and, and probably Maya and her answer to that question as well, what is really brilliant about this conversation is that when Maya was talking about choking, you and I are looking and we are in the same place. We are both women mm -hmm. who are vanilla yep. with the odd, you know, 99 flake on top. <laughs> <laughs> stracciatella, I like to call it. It's my friends. Stracciatella. Not full on vanilla. Stracciatella. <laughs> But we're in the same position. Mm -hmm. And I would say that even talking to you now, you are reinforcing that in my mind that you are not an object of... Sexual gratification. <laughs> you're a woman who is as vanilla as I am. Yep. And if I wasn't, I mean, again, still there's nothing wrong with that Absolutely because ultimately, not. you know, it's... But, but, but Carly's just asked a really important question. You know, and, and I'm sure, pretty sure that affects you as well, because I'm, I'm fairly sure, and I'm going to come to Gabby first, then you, but I'm fairly sure that if you mention to anybody that you are within the fetish community, immediately they're going to make assumptions. And if you mention that you are transgender, they're making assumptions. And I'm pretty sure if somebody asked you and you said, well, I'm married to a woman, they're going to make assumptions. But these are quite serious assumptions, and I'm pretty sure they are for you too. Where does this come from? I'm not an expert on this. <laughs> but I Sorry to put you on the, the spot. <laughs> uh, in, the, in, in, in the early years of my activism, uh, and I had to learn about gender identity in the same way as everyone else, right? So when I joined MGRM in the beginning, I, I knew very little about uh, trans people. And uh, I, I, I quite remember how I felt like, you know, a little bit like my mind was blowing that people could be assigned uh, a gender at birth and, and, and that was not something that they felt comfortable in uh, and actually transitioned. This, this seemed quite a revolutionary uh, thing uh, at the time. But once you kind of accept it, 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 some people are like, you know, feel this way and, and identify uh, in, in, in this manner, then everything else, you know, f follows. Uh, but I, I remember there, there was a, a, a bar in, in, in Amriha for, for a while that used to cater for the trans uh, community. And, and I went there a couple of times as an activist. Um, and and uh, again, you, you would find these very cisgender heterosexual men who would frequent uh, these uh, these places and, and I mean I, I don't really have a scientific explanation for it I just think that you know there's someone for everyone in a sense in the world right so uh, some people are attracted to trans uh, women this is just how it works. Um, uh, uh, I also agree with, with Carly that sometimes trans people are fetishized and, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I would hope that if you're looking to have uh, a, a relationship with someone, then you're seeing the whole person and not just one part of their identity. Um, uh, I mean... You know, I'm 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 not a big fan of extramarital affairs in the first place. So, uh, vanilla <laughs> sister, <laughs> vanilla sister. <laughs> we know they happen, and and you know, again, so long as there's consent, I have no problem. You know, with people having more than one party or not being monogamous. Uh, for me, it's all about informed consent. So, if this is uh, a choice people make for themselves with the full, you know, consent of their partners, then. Not, not an issue. But. Well, see, that now, beautiful segue into to Maya <laughs> over there because um, Gabby just used the word fetishized, which, again, I've never heard before, but it's great, but also talked about more than one partner. But coming back to what Carly was saying there and being kind of seen as an object because of your journey, d does that happen for you? That must happen for I your think, community. I think not just the community, I think that we as women, we all feel it and we all ha we're all objectified and all sexualized. We can't just be ourselves, we have to be a sexual object. I just watch, I spend my life on TikTok, it's terrible. But I see these amazing TikToks of um, 
it's a, a bit of a movement now. People, um, trans men and trans women, talking about essentially male privilege. And now, because they see both ends of the spectrum, they can see how they were treated before, po uh, before op and post op, and and having that experience of not being sexualized, especially for trans men, seeing that now that they they can just be themselves. They can go and just get some food, like can get some junk food, and they're not going to have someone going, oh, "What are you doing that for?" Sort of thing. Like you're not. I'm not here to be a sexual object so now maybe it's it's touching on that it's in a way it's refreshing that they're seeing yourselves as actual women biological women rather than um you know a lot of turfs would say uh sorry turf uh, trans exclusionary uh, for radical feminists thank you sorry i thought i'd jump in that one um whereas they would be more exclusionary at least they're seeing people as who they are um but unfortunately as they see them as objects like every, like every other woman so i think that that really comes into it New Mac Stack Mascara. Stack. 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 But bringing it that, then narrowing that down, that conversation down to to fetish or pansexual or whatever other kind of sub community within the sexual community in the, within the sexual conversation comes to, would you not agree though? Because we've used the word fetishized, would you not agree that that perhaps the fetish community is going to get more stigma and more preconception than other communities definitely um yeah definitely we, we, we all live in this kind of uh, cis hetero um sexual normative world where there's almost these like puritanical views on on sex it's this kind of also almost like farcical um cliche of what sex is and what it should be um so it's all going to feed into that um well i mean uh, cutting it to the right down to the to the core if you go to the cinema the chances are you're going to see a film let's say you go to see a, a, a rom-com uh, you're going to see a man a woman and they're going to have a normal sex scene normal sex scene a, a vanilla uh, <laughs> vanilla <laughs> sex scene oh my god they're going to have a vanilla sex scene, and that's what's portrayed. And therefore, that is what is portrayed as normal. Would you not agree? I mean, how do we change that? Well, ideally with more queer uh, producers and directors and uh, writers um, and a braver media world. Um, I think it will take time, but it's, you know, there are niches in, I mm -hmm. think, the, yes. the I think market we've... where people can access this kind. It's still difficult. It's still difficult to access a movie which has, you know, uh, a, a lesbian couple as their main character. And, and whenever one, you know, hits uh, mainstream, it's, it's always still a big, quite a big thing. Um, uh, and I, I would say the same would be for your community. Yeah, uh, I, I think I, it... The last one was probably Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Not a good representation. No, no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. Uh, but, but no, I totally agree. Like, um, how many times do you just see just a straight couple and they're, they're on, the f on the stage, man and uh, cis man and woman, and they're, you just know at the end of the, the, the TV show or the thing, they're going to get together because that's what straight people do. And there's just no chemistry between them. There's no, there's no interaction. It's just they are there. That's going to happen. Whereas you can see and these incredible queer relationships, the development and the, the sexual chemistry and that built. And, but you know that it's never going to happen. And it's, it's the biggest lip, like, thing of lip service. You see so many shows that what was it, queer baiting where they just they, they know that the leading fans on. It's a deliberate a lot of time because a lot of time they don't want to get it past censors. Like say if they want to produce a movie in China where they know they're not going to get a set, a past the censors with a, a queer, uh, queer relationship. So they'll... It'll just be a bit of lip service. I'll like put it there so anybody that knows a bit of queer coding, um, queer coding is um, in TV and film where it was illegal to be gay. So a lot of people did things behind the scenes where if you know, you know, sort of thing. Um, so a lot of times, even though it's it's legitimate and you, you can show things in the Western world um, with queer relationships, they don't want to and they know they can get more money out of it if they don't. 
but they can just kind of slip it in there and people that know will know and they feel like that's just enough for us. And I think that's the same with like uh, with fetish and with kink. Pink, people will kind of slip things in to make it a little bit subversive, a little bit edgy, but not really portray it in a positive or um, in a, a beneficial way in that explores sexuality for people because everybody does it. Um, kink and, and fetish are, are just in the same way that sexuality, sensuality, gender, it's all on a spectrum. So we're all exploring these things in different ways. And it's it's all going to be as different as each of us. So why shouldn't we explore those stories? Sorry, I've rappled. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> no, no, just no. trying to think of a, let's say, a rom-com where you've got the main character who's transgender. I can't think of any. No. I know American Horror Story because I've just recently oh, saw it. Um, the hotel one, there mm. was a transgender character. Um, but I wouldn't say that was the main plot. It was a sideline. But... If you think about films, and it's thank you for explaining that, because I've always wondered why in films, and certainly British films, I would say, uh, gay community is misrepresented. It's normally, you know, a comedy part. It's normally... The uh, villain. Or the villain. And certainly... Or they die at the end. And, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Or they kill the, the, the sex <laughs> Always <laughs> die. Or they're the sex worker or the <laughs> pole dancer. Yeah, exactly. Happily Again, sexualized. <laughs> Always. And the same for transgender, yes, I see. So, I mean, in fact, there was um, Disclosure. I think Laverne Cox produced it and it actually highlights how, um, you know, Ace Ventura, I remember um, watching it as a kid and the villain was actually transgender and when they kind of reveal that she's transgender, like this group of policemen start throwing up and kind of, and I had watched it, but I had never, it never kind of occurred to me that, you know, it was just there. But knowing that now. Yes, knowing that now, that even looking back. How feel? That's... It's being more educated kind of sometimes I tell my friends I wish I was I was still ignorant because even friends I used to love friends but now if you look back at all this homophobic slurs the fact that trans um, that uh, Chandler's ma father is transgender and all the jokes and I mean for the time unfortunately you know people weren't as educated but you know looking back now kind of one of my favorite series is just I don't feel comfortable watching it anymore, you know, or even with my friends, like, tell me, oh, I love watching it, like, what re reruns and sort of thing, like, really? I think we've moved past it now, sort but of. That brings us right back to the point that we started with, which is what happened to change society, to be able to accept more and to talk more, and what do we do more of to keep making this more accessible for somebody who is going through your journey or your journey or your journey because I mean in fairness Gabby I would have thought for you you don't want somebody who is exploring their sexuality to discover or to to have the courage to discover that they are gay at 30 years old you'd rather that they had that earlier on so what is happening again I ask the question and what do we do more of how do we change this how do we change friends Yes, well, I, I think, well, we can't yes, I think for the LGBTIQ community, um, I think there's a lot more visibility today and a lot more role models. Uh, as we said, there's quite a lot of mainstreaming that's happening in schools, resources that are available in, in classrooms, teachers who are getting trained. So all of that is happening um, incrementally. So, so that helps. I'm, I'm not sure it's the same for uh, the, the part of sex sexuality that, that Maya is representing here today. I think that's still very much invisible and, and still uh, stigmatized and, and much more difficult to, to talk about openly and for people who are, in a sense, in that world to, to come out as being a part of that world, right? So um, I think there's a lot more to do there because there's, in a way, a lot more of uh, morality, now, right? Policing of, of sexual behavior, which is uh, still there in when, when we talk, whereas with gay relationships, they're, they're sort of much more normalized now, right? Gay people can be parents, they can have children, they can adopt, they can raise families. They so see, you See, on the LGBTQI+, I think everybody understands what lesbian and gay families are or, or couples are. They understand that. That's become very commonplace. But if you were to stop someone in the street and ask what the other letters 
represent and what do they mean, they're probably not going to be able to just drop that off the top of their head. Well, trans, perhaps increasingly so. We have also quite a, a, a visible trans community. And, and since the law passed in 2015, also quite a growing trans male community, because before 2015, it was mostly trans women who were visible and in the media and, and people knew they existed. But uh, trans men were really invisible and, and the law helped change that by uh, separating the, the, the medical side of things and the medical transition from, from the legal gender recognition uh, and, and uh, trans men felt empowered and, and, and came out. So we're seeing that. Um, so I think they might not know how to explain it very well, but, but they know what uh, a trans person is. Um, intersex, less so, I think. Uh, so that's the other letter in the LGBTI acronym. Uh, and intersex. The I is? In intersex. So intersex are people uh, whose uh, sex characteristics, right, um, which means it could be your chromosomes, your genitalia, your hormones. Um, There's an ambiguity. Right? Um, yes, we'll, we'll have elements of, of both male and female. So, so we're not talking about anything psychological in the sense we're talking really about a, a person's biology. And, and there is a percentage of uh, people who are born intersex, which means they are not clearly defined as being either male or female. Um, and, and that can be... Um, I wouldn't say diagnosed, it's, it's not uh, the right word, but, but it, it, someone can, uh, in, in a sense, be identified as being intersex uh, at birth or, or later on in, in life. So in Malta, the intersex community is very, very, very invisible, even from each other. Uh, so Probably the easiest way to explain it is the way I explain it to everyone who kind of asks is hermaphrodism is a form of intersex, but it's not the only form of, of intersex. Um, I had read about a case where a woman who had a tiny uterus also considered intersex. So that's the easiest way to explain it, basically. But if you want the textbook definition, it's ambiguous genitalia. I think. But not, not, it's not, not only related to genitalia. So it could be chromosomes. So we, we tend to assume that you either have an XX chromosome and are uh, female or an XY chromosome and are male. Uh, but there's also XXY, XO, and, and so on. So there are different chromosomal combinations um, which are possible and, and also different ways that uh, different intersex variations manifest in, 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 in different people. So... When you said about the transgender community being more present in Malta, Carly, you pulled a bit of a face there. Um, I'm going on my studies. Last year I finished my dissertation, which is Access to Employment for Transgender Women in Malta. So I actually had to speak to eight transgender individuals. Um, what One element that came out which surprised me was transphobia within the trans community. Um, so there's the internal transphobia where you're kind of identifying I'm female, I'm not transgender, I'm not a transgender female, I am female, I'm not like the rest of them. I am a woman and they are transgender. So there's that. And I think everyone goes through that initially. You know, you accept it and you move past it. But one um, person shocked me specifically it's like um so we don't want to be sexualized and we don't want to be you know objects of sex but and then like most transgender women don't help themselves you know everyone's going out in mini skirts and like acting like sluts and sort of thing and i'm there thinking like okay i mean but is aren't we like saying there's no one way to be a woman so kind of why are you pointing the finger at a trans woman who's just kind of you know maybe just transitioned and she's just experiencing the initial world, you know, accepting her and seeing her for the woman she is sort of thing. I mean, I think we've all gone through it where, you know, you kind of just want to look good and maybe feel sexy for yourself sort of thing. And then you've got like, it, it's again like women hating on women sort of thing. So I mean, it's my experience, but I wouldn't say, I mean, friendly, there's there's definite friendliness with, within everyone, but you've got others who are like, no, it's not my community, I don't attend gay parties because it's not my scene, sort of thing. It's like, okay, like to each his own, but 
I don't feel that there is much of a community myself, personally. Do I you, could be wrong. Do you think they're more identifying as like pick me's sort of thing? Like I'm not like the rest. Like I, this is what I find in, in my community as well, in that... Um, so I'm a switch, and so I respond to the desire of my partner, and we're probably more dominant or, or submissive. And I definitely find being more submissive, you're, um, as a woman, there's more of the stigma there. Mm -hmm. Because, and this the same, um, it's like, well, we were talking earlier about like the, the morality police and that sort of thing. It all comes in there. Well, I'm, I'm not like them. I'm not, you know, I'm not subjugating myself for a man or a, a, of a woman. It's within gay relationships as well. That kind of submissiveness mm -hmm. is seen as a negative. Like you cannot do right for wrong. Um, you're either on the one end of the scale, like you're, um, you're setting yourself up to be in this sexual demon, then oh, you only deserve what you get sort of thing. Um, and it's like, it's all about females, and this is why this is what this entire episode is about: female sexuality and not shaming it. It's part of our makeup. It's the one biological em imperative we have as humans is to. I won't say the f word. Please <laughs> 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 don't. We I'll don't keep, need to go that far. <laughs> I'll keep it PG thirteen. Um, but it's it's the one thing that really we're on the earth to do. So why is there so much stigma uh, stigmatize uh, stigmatization against women embracing that? Like. You're less of a woman if you enjoy sex? No. And you just mentioned your community there, because I've just asked about, Gabby, about the, the LGBTQI community. I've asked you about the, the transgender community. I think most people who are not part of a fetish or kink community wouldn't even be aware that there is one. Mm -hmm. Is there one in Malta? There is one in Malta, yeah. It's small. <laughs> but um, I think because we have a very conservative country, obviously we're very progressive for rights, but attitudes take a lot longer to, to progress. Um, we have like get-together munches that are available uh, that the community do get together. So we, it's just really... We get together and have a drink and get to meet like-minded people. It's, it's not you know what you'd see on the movies where you think it's like whips and chains and <laughs> it's really not. We'd sit in a quiet bar and have a drink, um, but it's just meeting like-minded people, which can be really refreshing. It makes you realise you're not a weirdo. You're not you know an odd one out. There are people like you, and most people are like us. And you're saying like the vanilla is the norm. I don't think it is. I, I think it's just seen as because it's there's this this morality morality policing against it but most people do do kinky things in their home life like i said it's if it's any act really and as far as i know that's not for procreation so everybody does it everybody you know has a bit on the side to get them you said something thrilled. really really important just there because mm -hmm. carly and i just nodded <laughs> away you said that i think it was legislation has mm -hmm. changed mm -hmm. but attitude hasn't oh yeah that's across all communities yes and no in, in a sense <laughs> It's true. Uh, I think uh, attitudes take a, a little bit longer to change, but, but I think legislation has also helped to change attitudes. So in, in, in this sense, we, we can di see this from surveys that have been conducted. That, uh, for example, the, the, the prevalence of, of harassment and violence that are experienced by the LGBTIQ community as reported by them is much lower than it is in other uh, European countries. So, so we do know that it does have a positive impact but of course yes and, and there will always be pockets of resistance and sometimes growing uh, resistance that is also quite vocal this is something that social media makes possible right that you have small groups of people in in a sense it is something that we uh, benefited from as a movement that we had our voices amplified by the media um, and, and and the same can be said today of, of counter movements who for example, oppose the the notion that transgender people even exist, right? That uh, someone could identify as transgender and that this is a um, a legitimate way to to be. Um, so you you will find groups of people who strongly object, you know, to any family that is not the traditional heteronormative family or anyone whose gender identity does not, uh, you know, um, correspond to the gender assigned at birth. Every time each of you have spoken and you've answered a question, there's been at least another 15 questions that have been <laughs> pinging off in my mind. And I think we need to do this more. We need to talk about this topic again and probably much more in depth. But as we come to the end of this podcast, I'm going to ask each of you to share a word of encouragement and empowerment to anybody who's listening to this that finds themselves in a similar position to where you've been and 
for you, Gabby, you know, maybe they're younger and they're, they're exploring themselves. How would you encourage somebody who's in there, who, who identifies with you? Well, I think it's about uh, looking for spaces where you can feel affirmed in your own identity and making sure that you choose the right role models and that you get the information that you need and that you uh, reach out for help if you need it um, and, you know, read and look at yourself as, as, you know, for me, so long as you're not causing anyone any harm, then uh, whatever you're into is what makes you you and, and that's special. No one else can be that. Maya, for you, I mean, there might be people listening to this who identify with something that's a little less vanilla. <laughs> so how would you encourage a woman to explore that side of her sexuality? And what would you say to her? I think just really saying, take the internet with a pinch of salt. Do your research. There's lots out of there. There's lots of really good resources on how to explore these things in a safe and, and consensual way. Um, and just... I don't know. It, I think it's really important shows like these. I think just watching thing, things like these where women talk about women's um, issues and get their information out because we, we help each other more than a lot of maybe male-dominated media might paint it out. So I think we can help each other a lot more. Thank you. And Carly, leaving Thanks. it with you to the end. I mean, obviously I agree with what both um, Gabby and Maya said. I think the only thing I will add on to that is um, people are going to talk, whatever you do, whether it's good, whether it's bad. So kind of just learn that, you know, as long as you're comfortable with, your, with what you're doing. And as Gabby said, as long as you're not going out there and actively hurting anyone, just do you, you know, the only person who's ever going to give you everything you want is you. So believe in you, ignore what people say, because whatever you do, people are going to speak and just enjoy life. You know, it's too short. So don't waste it. Just trying to blend into boxes or satisfy people's perception of you. Ladies, thank you. Can we do this again? Can we talk about this again? Definitely. Because I think there were so many things that are still left unsaid, but I know that, that you're working hard to provide resources for anybody that needs to find out more. But for now, thank you so much. My morning starts here with an experience that's unforgettable. A precise roast and a generous crema. Taste the unforgettable espresso.